Welcome back to Millennia. This is my ultimate beginner's guide video. Aimed at a beginner to intermediate audience, this video will teach you everything you need to know to not just play Millennia, but to thrive within its world. I've carefully broken it down into chapters, time cards below, as well as some marked as a little bit of extra information. Extra for experts, if you will. So sit back and relax, and let's talk Millennia. As in most 4X games, knowledge, research, technology is power, and Millennia is no different. Not only will you unlock things from the word go, like the first research building in Tribal Elders, or indeed one of the more powerful early tile improvements inside of literal workers, but also of course technology will lead you through the ages. It is the person in the lead, technologically, who usually sets the course for everybody else, deciding which age they'll enter and which ages they'll forego. Research, in my opinion, is therefore more important in Millennia than any other game. Keeping fast, keeping ahead and in the lead is vital. And here are some ways to improve your research. Knowledge buildings will be absolutely fundamental, starting with tribal elders, you have council, and there are many more upgrades available, depending on what way you take your national spirit and technologies, so on and so forth. One knowledge mightn't look like much, but don't forget you start with only two, so building just one of these in one region will give you a 50% boost early on. This can be vital for beating the AI to a certain age that you might want to play. Mid to late game tile improvements, starting with books and working your way through the rare earth metal computer supply chain can also provide huge amounts of knowledge. I'll return to setting up the basics of these improvements later in the video. Now let's talk cultural powers. There is no culture tree as such in Millennia, though of course things like your government or national spirits will provide kind of sort of culture trees or tech trees that will give you great early boosts like food and plus one knowledge indeed on the homeland for extra growth and research. The cultural powers that you unlock will be directly influenced again by your domains, your government, your national spirits and technologies. However, some of them will remain constant, even right from the beginning of the game. Usually they're all fairly powerful, however there are three that stand out to me. Create Town, right from the start, will help you to increase a region's level. Generating wealth per adjacent improvement, influence to spread your borders, improving its defenses, and overall, ultimately, enabling it to grow. Creating Town is therefore probably the most significant thing you can do, Providing you have a growing and thriving region, you can reach towards new resources by building towns that will also establish road networks, as you can see. The unlocked pioneer unit will have a similar effect when you construct an outpost using its ability, allowing you to claim a bit more land and construct trading outposts to grab its resources. And don't forget that domain powers are helpful here too. Expand town to grow your region level further and develop a specialization for extra yield. A very good move. And good news on the cultural power front, the second and third powers that I like the most are generally unlocked next, or very close to it. The first is the first exploration power, knowledge. Basically, convert the culture that your cities are generating into knowledge. Second is, right below it in this case, raise army. This will spawn you two units, generally two of the best or better units that you can produce in accordance with the age that you're in and your technology. This is a great way to quickly pump out units and ultimately turn the tide of a fight. You can spawn them in friendly territory, including in your towns. So hopefully, in a case like this, you can very quickly and easily get them close to enemy targets. And if you want to really get down and dirty into the detail, you can select a tile and see how much influence it will cost you to expand to that tile. This one, you'll note, only costs 2.18, and I'm about halfway there already. So if I jump into this region, it's influence generation, which you can see, wham bam, thank you ma'am, right here, uh, which of course is fed into by buildings, starting with the dolmen and then progressively upgrading as you move through. Uh, you'll be able to reach out and grab tiles faster. This one, as you can see, not near the town, costs much more at 15 and the further out you go, it becomes impossible to grow. So keep your influence generation in mind and utilize towns to grow and expand your borders, reach out and get more resources to work. Now I've got a quick tip 
on early exploration. It's more important in Millennia, arguably, than some other 4X games. Moving your initial warbands around instead of keeping them based in your city is absolutely advisable. And as you can see here, the unlocks that you can get even just from those little goodie huts can be extraordinary. Unlocking new domains early or units like this scout that I've picked up here in this case, which will enable me to explore even further, perhaps unlocking, discovering monuments and paving the way to a alternate age in the third era of the game. As you explore, you might run into some other structures as well, like these barbarian encampments that will spawn barbs, so watch out for those, or these neat little independent cities, which you can capture fairly early, somewhat easily, to pick up a vassal without needing to spend an extraordinary amount of government experience early on on a settler. Your city will be able to defend itself at least early on against barbarians, even without any walls, so you can kind of afford to commit quite heavily to sending your myriad of early troops to fight the opponent and capture cities early. I think this strategy works extraordinarily well in Millennia as it stands. The early unlocking of defenses and subsequently every other military technology, by the way, is particularly important here. You'll probably notice the AI take advantage of this strategy as well as it attempts to land grab and it can be very hungry to land grab and settle extra territory. So bear in mind that it is also a race against the clock. I'm not usually an early war guy, but this does seem like an optimal strategy to me. Finally, any unlocked warfare domain powers, including the default volunteers, can also be used in a similar way to convert warfare domain experience that's being generated by your cities into brand new, generally relevant units. Going for the strategy of early aggression allows you to spend your government experience on perhaps raising tribal armies instead of spawning settlers or unlocking this tree. And that's pretty important because basically you get the best of both worlds. Sending your armies in to take territories like Madrid, bear in mind it will be quite difficult. You will suffer a few losses and getting behind enemy walls can be particularly challenging. So it'll take a bit of a go. It's not just dead easy, but generally speaking, you'll be able to crack them, especially once the walls are down. Sending in an army with balanced troop types, including ranged, mobile, lined units, and anti-defensive units when you unlock them, will be the best way to achieve this, but early on, just get in there and take them down. You can choose to destroy them, harness their population and send it back to the capital, adding a bit of chaos and wealth to the world, or make them a vassalized territory. And as I say, a very quick, relatively easy, though we did take a few losses way, of picking up early vassals. A reminder, if you haven't seen any of my other Millennia videos, that vassals, even though they're our cities, we can't control them. We don't choose what they build. They will contribute income to us, and we can buff this in a whole load of ways, and integrate them over time if we want to take over decision making. The big implication of doing that is that the amount of culture that you generate per turn, or the cost of the cultural powers, will change. This is because regions require a certain amount of culture as upkeep, so cultural income is valuable for supporting nations that include a large number of regions. The more regions you integrate, the more culture you'll need to generate. Vassals will be fairly weak by themselves, though you can use things like governments, here the Kingdom one for example, to significantly buff them. And if you're going to play a vassal strategy, I'd highly recommend you do that. You don't need to integrate them, of course, that wouldn't be the strategy, but raising their prosperity, sending merchants and envoys and those other units and powers that I showed you earlier is vitally important. I'd also say that culture powers are generally more important, especially early on. Try and keep your production of those fast. During all of the conflict, it can be easy to forget about a little resource buried down the bottom left of your screen here, your improvement points, which will later turn into specialist points as well as other things that will uh, add on to this, actually. Improvement points from the get-go are incredibly useful, though. The tiles within your city don't tend to provide a lot of yield. You can hit the Alt key, if you like, to quickly turn it on to see just what you're generating. This tile, by far and away, is the best one because it's the only one that I've improved with a clay pit. And as a quick recommendation here, building one or two of these clay pits early on is really important. It provides your city with production to build your buildings faster 
and improvement points per turn. So good to scaling up, of course, as they are the currency that you'll need to build more tile improvements. However, if you don't have the workers available to work these tiles, then they may not be as useful, or indeed very useful at all. But the clay pit here, if I work it, will provide me with the benefits. So I need to make sure that a dude is assigned here so that I'm actually getting the goods over on the right hand side of my screen because in this case it is the goods, not the land, that's providing value to the city. So we need to make sure that our city continues to grow as workers are correlated broadly to the population of a city and the region level of course. All of the things that I've talked about in this video are heavily integrated. For a city to grow, so long as the region level and size can support it, you'll also need to meet its needs, starting with food, and progressively as you move through the ages, more and more needs will be added to your cities, your regions, across the empire. It's important to keep these above 100% and ideally in the green, surging up toward 200%. And of course you can achieve that, you can meet the needs like food, through tile improvements as well as buildings within a city. And that's why expanding out to resources, take these deer for example, I can build a relatively cheap hunting camp early on, providing me with wealth, resources I don't tend to prioritize, and food from the meat. You're near the ocean, you can build harbors, all kinds of ways to get this. Farms of course, most notably a great way to gather food as well. Some needs are harder to manage, perhaps less obvious. Take for example chaos generated by warlike activity and other nefarious affairs, which can lead to these events over time if you let enough chaos build up. Chaos can also lean into stability, or unrest as Millennia calls it, alongside war, your city being under siege and not meeting the needs of your people. And all of these things, all of these factors will contribute to the overall unrest of a city. If you let unrest spiral out of hand, bad things will happen. Your population will rebel against you. Potentially, you might just lose the city altogether, creating a new AI player to fight against. I found that garrisoning units, as well as the unrest buildings, are the best way to stop this through the ages. Speaking of the ages, pretty important to address them as they are one of Millennia's defining features. And as I mentioned earlier on, it's usually a good idea to be in the lead, unless there's only one option, in which case you could argue maybe it doesn't matter quite so much, as there is in the first instance where you move through to the Age of Bronze. Moving through an age, once you meet the required number of technologies, three early and four later, as well as any special conditions that alternate ages, crisis ages, indeed victory ages might have. It's important to plan ahead, keep them in mind for next time as well. Equally as important is to keep track of what's going on up in the top left here. You can monitor the age progress, who's in the lead, how far you are, and any other players leading us into the next age, potentially. And at the end of a turn, as you roll through to the next one just as I've done here, you will indeed advance the world. Or somebody else will. It doesn't really matter too much. Each age introduces a new set of conditions, new needs for your cities or new game rules that will change the way you play or unlock new yields or metrics that you need to be aware of. One sideline quick tip that I'd add here is you should always check in not just to add your next research, paying attention to the specific tile improvements that you might need. The saw pit is a standout improvement, as is the thing next door to it, actually, the crane. And if you want to make use of the clay pits you've been building, Maybe the kiln. There's a lot of value inside of basically every technology in Millennia. Unlocking new domain powers like another one of my personal favorites here in the Age of Bronze to claim territory using the domain XP. You can of course go back and research old technologies, right? I'm going to want to go back and get the first research building. I'm also probably going to need farming so that I can actually build some farms. It's therefore pretty important to go back and research the now slightly discounted technologies because they're from a previous age and other bonuses are available too. This is just another incentive to move through quickly and to set the pace in millennia. You really will have much more fun and ultimately probably find victory if you set the pace. 
National Spirits could basically take a massive video all for themselves. I lean towards Warfare being the best generally. However, I think there's a lot of power potentially in all of these. The thing is, they're specialized. So you need to lean into that specialization. Maybe picking the same type, like engineering every time, to lean into that specific domain power and the extra tile improvements, resources, bonuses, units, and more that these very powerful spirits and their associated trees can unlock. You'll unlock a new national spirit and government roughly every two ages at two, four, six, and eight. So keep that in mind as you're moving through them. You'll keep your national spirits and their benefits. However, when you choose a new government, you throw out the old type and anything generally that you might be generating from its perks. Domains, however, will stand the test of time, generally speaking, lasting through the ages. Speaking of ages, take care as you enact this strategy, as you might just lean yourself into the Blood Age, as just one example of how it might happen. And also kind of a fun fact, when it says units from other nations, it isn't just talking about the nations that can actually win the game, the other empires. It's also talking about these small, independent, now nah, my vassalized territories. So you can, perhaps sometimes almost accidentally, lock yourself into a crisis age. Another important note is that these ages, like the Age of Blood, once you meet the condition, the yellow condition, you are stuck with it as your choice. The only alternative to avoid it would be to hope that a different player catches up and chooses a different option. And finally, a quick note on tile improvements and resource chains. It's not just building the tiles and getting the goods, but also how you use them. The city at the moment is meeting its food needs fairly adequately, and it's got five production. We can do better now with more technology with the goods we've already got. A very powerful improvement early on if you have access to forest is the forester, because the forester is another production improvement. Adding more production to the city plus two when consumed, allowing you to build your buildings and units faster. Let's also now do a little bit of value add. So jumping in, selecting a category, woodwork, and the saw pit could be an option. In fact, generally speaking, it's a very powerful one, giving you even more production, converting three logs to lumber. And the paper maker opens up future opportunities for books and a whole load of knowledge. Or I could turn to my clay pits and instead go into something like stonework and build a kiln. This will generally be easier for most settings and players because you can build the clay pit on many more tiles than you can the forester, for obvious reasons. With a kiln online and being worked, I'm now generating domain experience from my tiles, engineering in this case, which is great, and as you can see, converting the clay into bricks, basically doubling the output of that good. Use your ever-advancing deep supply chains to continue to meet the needs of your cities. Meeting your needs again will ultimately ensure you have the biggest cities possible alongside that region level. Now I might turn to cooking, for example, where if I'd like to build a plantation, I could get the very powerful press online for an extraordinary amount of food and wealth. More easily and readily to most players, though, will be the mill, which can convert regular old wheat from farms or rice into flour. This will now add even more opportunity into my growing city, perhaps focusing a little less on production and a little more on food to max out its needs at 200%. How you manage it is up to you, but don't forget to pay attention every time you grab a new technology and especially when you move through into a new age to make sure that you take advantage of the step change that is on offer when it comes to yield from your tile improvements. There's plenty more that I haven't discussed so in my closing thoughts I might mention something like the leader that provides a buff to its entire army using its unique tactic stats and this one is particularly strong thanks to me picking the mercenary's national spirit able to use a leader to spawn more units, mercenaries. That's just one example of the kind of depth that I obviously can't cover 
in a 20 minute video, but I hope that this video has given you a broad based introduction across the many different areas of millennia and put you on the right step for victory. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you wonderful people next time.